Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Five thirty is great, sorry guys. <laughs>
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priest and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria and I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us remain seated and read the psalm responsibly. I'll read the odd numbers and you read the even numbers. Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Let all those whom the Lord has redeemed proclaim. He gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert ways. They were hungry and thirsty. Their spirits languished within them. He put their feet on a straight path to go to the city where they might dwell. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Whoever is wise shall ponder these things and fill well with the mercies of the Lord. A reading from the book of Colossians. If you have been raised from Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, 
then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> O oh God, take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. When I was in seminary, there was a course that I always wanted to take. And it was always at a time that didn't work in my schedule, but I still remember the title of that course, and I still wish I'd found a way to take it. And it was called The Gospel in the New York Times. <laughs> and I think of it from time to time over the year. And it came up to my mind this week because there were several items in the Washington Post on the thread that I'm following today. Um, and so I'm going to, since I have a brief amount of time and you can't cover church history in 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to hopscotch over church history along the way, but I will come to the Washington Post at the end. Scholars tell us that several hundred years from now, when people are studying church history, this period will be known for two things. The first is ecumenism, and the second is liturgical renewal. Both have influenced every denomination in every place. So in order to set the stage for this, I'm going to begin with tradition. Tradition means to transmit, to hand on, or to hand over. Originally, it was used in Roman law to refer to the concept of legal transfers and inheritance. It entered the English language in 1384. The way we use it in our culture, it sounds almost like the way we've always done it. But in the life of the church, it contains a somewhat deeper understanding. The understanding is that when, whatever it is, is handed down or handed on, that it is shaped and changed by the hands through which it passes. You might think of Play-Doh, for example, if you passed it around a circle of children. The composition remains the same, but the shape changes. In the church, the Holy Eucharist has changed many times even as the core remains the same. From the time of the Last Supper, it has been handed on through centuries of history, many cultures, and many languages, and yet it remains the Lord's Supper. So now I am going to Roman numeral two. I want to say a little bit about John Mason Neal. John Mason Neal was the warden of Sackville College. In our world, college usually means an academy of some sort, but this is England and it meant an almshouse. 
John Mason Neal wrote or translated more hymns than I can count. But here is a short list of fewer than a dozen that you will probably know from the 82 hymnal. All glory, laud, and honor. Christ is made the sure foundation. Come ye faithful, raise the strain. Creators of the stars of night. Jerusalem the golden. Oh, what their joy and their glory must be. Of the Father's love begotten, sing my tongue the glorious battle, and good King Wenceslas. However, in spite of all of those good things, he also wrote a paper <clears throat> entitled The History of Pews. It was a paper that was read before the Cambridge Camden Society in 1841. And beyond his opening sentence, <clears throat> he says, I was the more willing to lay down before you whatever information I may have been able to procure on it, because pews have never yet found an historian, nor need we wonder at this. Now, this is the point at which you have to fasten your seatbelt. For what is the history of pews but the history of the intrusion of human pride and selfishness and indolence into the worship of God? A painful tale of our downward progress from the Reformation to the Revolution. The constant struggle to make Canterbury approximate to Geneva to assimilate the church to the conventicle that was an illegal assembly of Protestant sects. In all this context, the introduction of pews, as trifling a thing as it may seem, has exercised no small influence for ill and an equally powerful effect for good would follow their destruction. Hence it is that from the first moment of our existence as a society, <clears throat> we have declared an internecine and deadly war against them, that we have denounced them as eyesores and heart sores, that we have recommended their eradication in spite of all objection and at whatever expense, that we have never listened to a plea for the retention of one, for we knew well that if we could not destroy them, they would destroy us. He goes on for 24 pages. So now you ask, what could possibly have outraged an Anglican priest that he could have written 24 pages of fierce indignation about pews of all things? And the short answer is the Reformation. <clears throat> Before the Reformation, the congregation that gathered for worship stood. No pews were needed or even occurred to anyone. The only seats were a few around the edge of the room for those who were infirm. Sermons were all of maybe five or 10 minutes and services were short. However, the reformers thought there was much too much emphasis on the sacrament and an insufficient role given to the word. So those short sermons grew to be an hour or so in length, which is what launched the introduction of pews. I chose this because it seemed such an amusing example of resistance to liturgical renewal. So now, Roman numeral three. The church has to adapt to colonial America and other colonies, no doubt. For the first century or two, there were not enough clergy to cover the number of congregations springing up. Over time, it became usual for a parish to have a priest once a month, maybe. And on other Sundays, people gathered for morning prayer because it did not require a priest. It could be led by a member of the laity. Some of us will remember those days. In many churches that did not change until long after there were plenty of clergy. In my childhood, we had morning prayer 
our five choirs sang canticles for the daily office, and we had four clergy. But the practice did not change until work began on what was called for decades the new prayer book. So, Roman numeral four. The 79 Book of Common Prayer was under construction for years before many of us became aware of it. Then we had another 10 years or so of what was called trial use, the Green Book, the Zebra Book, and others. One of the first changes that people became aware of during this period of trial use was that the Holy Eucharist was identified as the primary service on a Sunday. I recall a lovely elderly gentleman in a state of utter bewilderment asking every week. We have to have communion every week, but I don't sin that much. Well, as some of you will remember, the 28 prayer book was rather different from the 79 in some respects. It didn't have a three-year lectionary. Readings were the same every year. And it was much, much more penitential in tone. Hence the gentleman who didn't sin that much. At the time of the breaking of bread, for instance, we had the prayer of humble access without fail. If you remember it, join me. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Some of you do remember this. All right, so now I might just note before I leave that one that the scholars cringed. They worked very hard to get it out of the 79 prayer book. I think they removed it altogether from right two, but you have an option in right one, something like that. But their objection was both to its theology and to its placement. Its placement was long after you'd already been resolved. So. The 79 prayer book was followed by a collection of essays by some of the scholars involved in that process. And although you may not know it, liturgical renewal continues. I'm thinking of Leaps and Boundaries, the prayer book of the 21st century. And all of these things that I'm referring to are on this table here. So if you want to come and browse at uh, at the peace or after the service, feel free. So, first we have Marion Hatchett. Again, these guys have a sense of humor, I must say. So, Marion Hatchett, uh, let's see, wrote an essay entitled Unfinished Business in Prayer Book Revision. He was one of the people who worked on the shape of the 79 prayer book. He was the author of the commentary on the Book of Common Prayer, which is down there. Um, he was also respected for his work on the hymnal 1982, the Book of Occasional Services. He taught at Suwani. And he began his essay in Leaps and Boundaries with two paragraphs that strike me as amusing. First, he writes, I am sure that none of us who worked on drafting committees for the various rites of the 79 Book of Common Prayer saw that book as finished or completed. Many issues had been raised that were considered inexpedient pastorally, a high-sounding word that often really means politically, he says, to deal with at the time. Deletion of certain old forms and terms might have resulted in the defeat of the book. Certain rubrics were deliberately made ambiguous. Certain things were implied, but for political reasons, not spelled out. 
The rubrics committee, this is where I think it gets funny, the rubrics committee operated on certain assumptions that at the time seemed reasonable to us. Hopefully they would not seem reasonable today, but you do not know. First, that clergy, church musicians, and others responsible for ordering worship can read italics. B, that they will read the rubrics. C, that they will read the book through from cover to cover. And D, they will compare the rubrics of this book carefully with those of prior prayer books and with the various trial rites that had been in use. And that they will realize that when the book opts for certain things, it's opting against alternative interpretations and practices. Well, as you can probably tell, the assumption seemed very funny and unrealistic to me and to others. In my mind's eye, I can see a long banquet table lined with all of those many prior prayer books and with all of the various trial rites and some poor parish priest walking slowly up and down and around the table trying to compare all the rubrics of those books with each other. Phew. Now another little piece under the 79 prayer book. This is from Howard Galley. Howard Galley was the working editor of the Book of Common Prayer and many other things. And this comes from his volume, The Ceremonies of the Eucharist, which is down here. He says, it frequently comes as a surprise to Episcopalians to discover that ancient liturgies contained nothing like a general confession. Repentance, when needed, was something done before one came to the Eucharist. The sign of reconciliation with God and one's brothers and sisters was not a general absolution, but the exchange of the peace. Now, to the Washington Post and the Episcopal News Service. On Saturday the 23rd, a week ago, there was an article that caught my attention that was titled, Some Catholics Upset by Ban on Old Latin Mass. Donna heard me on this the other day. Last year, Pope Francis severely limited the use of the old rite to increase global unity among the faithful. The local archbishop is not persuaded but has limited its use to three sites beyond the boundaries of the parishes. Then on Monday the 25th, this past Monday, there's a follow-up piece with the subtitle, Congregants will soon have to change language or change churches. Once again, we find liturgical resistance and liturgical renewal. Then yesterday, we have this piece I couldn't even get it into my sermon, I had to bring it. On the wall between church and state. Long, almost full page article here um, about this man whose specialty is the establishment clause and who's not sure there's ever gonna be one much longer. So, uh, that brings us in, to, in some ways to what's been going on at the General Convention. The General Convention, as some of you know, is usually eight days long. And there are usually two houses, House of Bishops, House of Deputies, and what is sometimes affectionately referred to as the third house, which is the exhibit hall, where there are hundreds and hundreds of vendors and places to eat and that sort of thing. And this time it was much reduced and streamlined. It should have been a year ago. They postponed it for a year because of the pandemic. This time they did away with the exhibit hall altogether and they reduced it from eight days to four. So, one of the most amazing things that happened at this convention was a resolution A059. It is an amendment to the constitution of the Episcopal Church. And it reads as follows. The 80th Convention of the Episcopal Church repeals Article 10 in its entirety and replaces it with the following. 
The following is two pages long, so I'm not going to read it. But a copy is here on the table if you're interested. For the first time, it defines the Book of Common Prayer as those liturgical forms and texts authorized by the General Convention. In other words, all of the various rites approved by convention will be elevated to prayer book status. As an amendment to the Constitution, it requires approval by two successive conventions, so this was the first. If this is a subject that interests you or you would like to know more about what's coming down the pike, there is actually a website for all of these things called EpiscopalCommonPrayer.org. I'm going to say that again, EpiscopalCommonPrayer.org. So, in an era of such division, it is worth noting that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the adoption of A059 was unanimous. You might just note that the General Convention is the largest legislative body in the world. And the adoption was unanimous. So we end a week in which we have Pope Francis trying to move the church forward, the Archbishop of Washington dragging his heels a bit, we have the Supreme Court working to narrow the Establishment Clause on church and state, and we have the General Convention unanimous for the first time in living memory. My friend Mary Glasspool was quoted as saying, I think this resolution is brilliant. I'm amazed. We're in this four-day General Convention, and somehow squeezing into that intensity has driven us deep. This is the best conversation I've been part of in the, the 11 years that I have been a bishop and coming to these meetings. So, thanks be to God. Life goes on, but feel free to look at anything that interests you. Um, most of these are things approved by the church, but some of them are by scholars after the 79th prayer. Now let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the night scene. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, by life and life. The prayers of the people are form three, found on page 387 of the prayer book. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacrifice. 
we pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works might favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray especially for Joyce, Christy, Amy and family, Donna, Anthony, Lois, Scholastique and family, Kay, Diana, Danielle and family, Rini, Steve, Audra and family, Laura, Ellen, Jean, Sam, and parishioners who are essential workers. Hasten, O God, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I don't think I have much in the way of announcements. Uh, as you know, Judith is on vacation, so there are some little things that don't happen because Judith's on vacation. Uh, Meg and Brad have been on vacation. They got back, I think, last night. She called me at 8.15 this morning and said, do I have to go to church today? <laughs> So I said, no, you're still on vacation. You do not have to go to church today. Whereupon the, she then said, can I still go to breakfast? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Michael, we've been thinking about you. Some of you, Michael's mother died this past week. She had been ill, so that was not a surprise. But nonetheless, he and his family will welcome our prayers. Now, anybody else? Huh. Moss, you want to introduce your friend? I can't hear you. I still didn't hear a thing, but I know she's Diana. I know she's from Texas. So that should be enough to get a conversation going if you get a chance to chat. <laughs> God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Make good your vows to the Most High.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
stand. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember the poor, visit the sick, pray for peace and work for justice, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Before I give the dismissal, I do have two more announcements. One is we need acolytes. So if you know of any likely prospects, uh, let us know that. We need acolytes. And the second is that in your bulletin is the announcement um, about the forum coming up for kids, which is next Sunday. So look in your bulletin if you have kids that that might apply to. All right, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.